Um, thank you for coming, folks. Um, initially, when I proposed this session, I had no idea what we were going to talk about. <laughs> Zero idea. I just knew that there were a lot of people in Vancouver who wanted to get into open source, and for a long time, they didn't have a resource for it. Um, and then uh, eventually they did, but it was just by accident that we started doing something for them. So I'll get into that. Um, my name is Manil. Um, on the internet, I'm usually keyword new. Uh, I work at Envision as a developer advocate. And um, I'm, for the past little while, I've been like involved in open source and I'm really liking it. And I personally got into it somewhat by accident. Some people I've talked to have actually experienced that. And um, I think that's kind of a shame that people have to find it by accident when you can get so much fulfillment out of it. So like, let's uh, try and bridge that gap. Um, and now this is not working. Fantastic. <laughs> is it? Yes. My keyboard is here. Uh, great. So first what we're going to do, we are going to try and figure out what brings people into open source. And then we'll go over a couple of things like background for this project and resources that other people might um, need. But that's what I want to get a feel for uh, in this room, just to see where people are coming from. People, I have had discussions with folks, uh, most recently at DevilCon in Tokyo, where um, this, uh, this person gave a talk with really good insight. I think you know I'm the person who made Ruby. Um, and he mentioned that everyone has their own different reasons for getting into open source, which makes it unusually tricky to figure out what appeals to people. And I want to see what, if anyone here was willing to share their motivations for getting into it. Um, I'll get started. Um, when I got into open source, it was kind of soon after I started becoming being a developer. And my path into becoming a developer was I used to work in a different industry, and I started getting involved in the developer community um, in my hometown, which is Vancouver. Uh, it's my hometown for the past like decade or so. So. Um, and the community was very helpful for me to get involved, like become a developer, which made me just kind of look for more like paths to become, to be part of the broader tech community, not just like in my city. So I started exploring and someone invited me to uh, Node School. And then someone invited Node School to uh, Node Interactive, which is a conference. And then someone invited Node, like that, that session into the Collab Summit. So it was just a step of like steps of accidents of people just saying, "Do you want to come? Do you want to come?" I'm like, "Okay, sure." Uh, thank you. Anyone else have uh, something they want to share? Okay. I started by writing plugins for PM Wiki, a uh, PHP uh, wiki engine that I ended up needing in order to build the website for my university department because. By doing that, I had enough possible deniability that I did not have to be an assistant on any of the courses that uh, they were teaching. <laughs> <laughs> and then it sort of went from there. And, uh, yeah. So initially, you were solving your own problem, and oh, then yeah, you found absolutely, that absolutely. it brought other benefits. <laughs> I'm sure eventually. <laughs> <laughs> it, it becomes a habit, sort of thing. It, yeah. it, it's certainly. Uh, easier for me now when I'm working for, I, I work for uh, as a consultant developer. I've been now with the same client for about a year and a half mm -hmm. and with a couple of other clients uh, before that. And it's easy for me. These are Finnish companies, but they are entirely private in most, most of what they do. But practically everywhere, it's, I've managed to find bits of things that make sense for me to uh, to release as open source, and I've been able to sell that to the corporations. That yeah, you, it, it's more worthwhile for you for this to be open source than for you to try and keep it all to yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's actually like for you, there's good business arguments to oh, participate yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because effectively, you you can. It, it's not that difficult to build a track record of if you actually build a useful thing and have someone else use it then even just one or two GitHub issues that someone files in externally, can, you can point at them and say, see, 
this thing now makes your code better, and you did not have to pay anyone for it, and you know you're getting a side benefit, and it's so far from what's your actual business that it doesn't matter for your uh, neg matter negatively for your uh, income at all. When I was learning Node.js, um, I was using a framework for a project called Botkit to build Slack bots. Um, and I was, I was just learning JavaScript at that point, and I would read the code, because it was on GitHub, like over and over and over, trying to figure out what the different connectors of the different platforms like Facebook, Slack, et cetera, would do. Um, and through doing that, I found some typos and comments or whatever. Um, and I, I think that, I think probably my first couple of pull requests were to fix typos or something. But through reading the code, I got more familiar with it um, by consuming a bunch of code. And um, eventually, you know, I got, I got to meet some of the people behind that project. And when Slack released a new the events API, I like was like, I know how to, I know how to do this now from the code. So I, I went and implemented it and, and whatnot, and sent you know pushed it over as a pull request, and it was ugly and terrible. And they took it and they cleaned it up and they merged it in. And that was the first time where I was like, "There's other people using code that I wrote." Oh, oh no, oh, oh no. <laughs> but um, that, that was you know how I first got into it and. Um, and I, I was hooked basically ever since finding problems to solve because they were out there in the project. So, and so it's like very different reasons for getting into it. We just heard three. Um, and to me, that sounds like different reasons to get included in to, to start participating in open source. I think with the so the reason we, we were talking about this is because in Vancouver, we've been running a workshop and it's called Getting Started in Open Source. It's an in person workshop that we do. And it's basically people come and the mentors in there are folks with stories very similar to this. We all had different reasons for getting involved. Some have been involved for less than a year. Some have been involved since I, you know, some people have been coding since like you're really young, that, that sort. Um, but everyone just wanted to put something into the community where here's this resource that if you're curious or you had questions or you weren't sure where to start, here's this in-person place you could show up to. Basically the reason people go to meetups. Um, so we started doing that in the summer of last year. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm going fast, but like we kept this session short because it's right before coffee break and y'all probably need your coffee. But we started doing that workshop last summer and we thought, Okay, um, we'll see how it goes for the first couple of months, and we will do it once a month, and we'll keep signups pretty low so we can have good discussion, and maybe some people will show up, and if not, we'll just like you know triage our triage our own issues while we're there all together. So it was kind of like a social sort of hangout, but from the big first month, it was already kind of like we had a waiting list, like people would just show up. Um, you have the usual meetup, like half the number of people who sign up show up, but we always had a waiting list, um, which showed us that there was an interest in, in at least in that city, uh, for getting some information in front of people that they might not have access to by just like randomly scouring the internet or taking a chance on uh, a code uh, on a project where they have no idea how they'll be received whether they'll get the support they need to, to level up from making like one small typo fix to actually putting in full pull requests that like deliver a feature or helping them run events. Because depending on which project you have, you could have bound code and code, like code commits. Um, so we started off by just making ourselves available and answering questions which were like kind of like, here's the myth of what open source is. It's a person coding and, and no one ever meets each other and no one talks. And it's just all code, stuff like that. And we were like, no. There is other ways you can start. There are different ways to contribute. And depending on which project you contribute to, like for example, the larger it gets, there are more than just code ways, like code channels to contribute to. And we weren't sure what the efficacy of this would be, like whether or not uh, folks would take this information and eventually, like, because that ideal outcome is they go and commit to a project. Um, and we weren't sure, and we don't have hard data yet, but we do know that there are some people who come back after making commits to projects, including Node, um, and they say, hey, now they want me to follow up and make this other pull request. How do we do this? Which is really, really, really good to hear. 
Um, one of our attendees actually went to the Code and Learn, which is no, no uh, interactives. Uh, like they give you a, a simple uh, commit to make. You make it, you get your pin, and then that's supposed to help start you like down the path of like committing more and more. I got my start there. Like that, my first commit was there at one of the Code and Learns. Um, so one person went to that, and I think since then they've contributed at least like, two more. Um, so I was hoping something like this would help the, get the conversation started on if this was something that other people wanted to run in their own town, or if you wanted something like this to happen in your hometown, what kind of resources would you want to give the people who are going to organize this? Um, so someone reached out from Austin and they, they had attended one of our uh, community committee meetings and they found out about this project. So they're like, um, well, I think you have a slide deck. Can we use that? Like, okay, that, that works, we use a slide deck. But what else would you need? Um, and they talked about a curriculum. So we actually started putting together a curriculum that touched on a lot of what we had discussed. We had a rough curriculum outlined and we thought, hey, um, there are some common questions. Maybe we put something together and we run through these each time we do our meetings. That worked. So we thought, hey, what if we split this up into three sessions that we just repeat? So month one, two, three, and then reset, start again. Um, that didn't work so well because some people would miss the first one and have no context for the second one, et cetera. So we just reset, went back to every month is its own standalone thing. But people still come back even though they know there will be repeats because we deliberately keep 50% of the time for open discussion. So even if we cover similar items like Git, NPRs and how to have like how to write communicatively on GitHub issues because even if you use GitHub in your org, you don't necessarily communicate using it very well. Um, at least in my experience, uh, people just want to talk about different stuff. The reason we added CI and continuous integration to what we talked to, to people about or what we introduced was because someone asked us about it, and then another person asked about it like two months later. So. Um, yeah, I wanted to open the conversation up to what people might look for in something like this. Would you want to see this in your own town? Uh, and if you wanted someone to organize it, what would you be looking for in a resource? I'd be really interested in learning about the, the curriculum and some of the resources that you guys have used. Okay. Um, personally, I, I would love to run an event like that you know, in, uh, in, in my hometown where I live currently. There, there are a lot, I feel like there are a lot of people that want to get involved in open source and having that curriculum to work through since you guys sounds like you tested it a bit. Uh, I'd be really curious about learning more about that personally. Would you at this stage, having contributed already to open source like projects, would you be, so I'm not saying that you should run it. I'm just saying is at this stage, would you be comfortable with the idea of like, yeah, I feel like I can shoulder that, you know, uh, responsibility of like, yeah, if they ask, ask me questions, I can answer it from the point of view of a maintainer. Like, or do you think it takes, is there a sort of barrier there? Well, I'm not sure if I would classify myself specifically as a, as a maintainer. I'm more of a contributor to other people's projects. Okay. But um, personally, I, you know, I would tell people, I don't know the answer to that, <laughs> you know? But what, what I hear from what you've told me so far about the workshop you've created, it sounds like, um, you know, you're showing people that open source software is community. Like that's that's what I'm getting out of it essentially, with it being, you know, 50% for open discussion, 50% for kind of teaching and walking people through. That sounds good. I would I would show up to that just because I love meetups and it would be great to have that community to spend more time with other people that are interested in open source. Mm -hmm. Whether they're noobs or whether they're people that are you know are way above me on the food chain of open source basically. Like, I don't know. I don't say I don't know how the other chapters are, but like, uh, Node School of Oakland definitely reaches the point eventually where you know people have kind of made their way through the curriculum. They still like it social. They still like it socially, so they'll come every month. Yeah. But there's not necessarily a ton to, to do. Yeah. So like this sounds in some ways like a natural progression of how you could keep it interesting for like like it sounds like it should be quick dovetail or something like that. The school group. So right. For the more intermediate developers. Advanced it's interesting you say that because we actually, for purposes of budget, we actually do it through notes for YBR. Yeah. Because well, we it seems have to make sense account. to me just from point of view of like what I see people doing at notes for YBR. Right. So I'd be interested in seeing 
the curriculum and maybe flipping it. So you're talking to a general audience mm -hmm. about contributing to general open source, right? Yes. But there are lots of smaller or just getting started open source projects that could use these materials as a way to bootstrap themselves. Like, oh, hey, here's a template for how people should contribute to our project. Why would we invent that from the beginning? Yeah. And a lot, when I see a lot of those projects going like, what is some big project that I admire do? I'm going to do it that way. Hmm. So this then becomes a resource for projects to attract hmm. more help. OK, well, yeah. maintainer burnout is a thing. So that totally makes sense. And also, like, a big part of just the apparatus and the tedium is, oh my goodness, I have to make a template for issues. Oh my goodness, I have to like come up with a set of tags. Mm -hmm. I have to like do all this basically paperwork. But again, I think the biggest realization is that it does skip all of that. But it also makes it that if you skip all of that, only people who already know what's going on contribute. Because they already have like the cultural knowledge. Whereas if you want new people, they have to either go through a program like this or the documentation has to be in each separate project. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand what people who don't know, don't know. Yeah, I, I was going to, uh, I like the idea of, uh, I completely agree with that. And, and where Blaine and I actually met was at a weekend long, we were mentors at a weekend long uh, open source hacking event that happens in Michigan, or is it? No. So Somewhere in the Midwest. Doesn't matter where it is. Anyway. Um, but I mean, so what I found difficult, was, and it was fun, and I, and I think that it, like, it was neat to go, but I definitely did feel that a weekend of <laughs> intense learning, like none of the people in the program really seemed to continue contributing to the projects, mm. and, and which was kind of disheartening. Like I didn't, I didn't actually find we got that many people actually off the ground. I, I, went months, I really reflect on what we got out of it. So I like the idea of a monthly thing. People can come it, back. It takes yes. a lot of mentorship to get someone actually to the point of mm -hmm. contributing. So, totally. Love that. I, I like that. And everyone has like varying levels of bandwidth. They, like, yeah. they could drop off purely for the fact that they're not getting paid for this and they need to pay their bills and then they'll come back when they have more time. Um, that, that made sense to me. Or you might contribute to something because you're using it really intensely and then you stop working on that project and you have mm -hmm. no problem. To use it anymore. Yeah, you know. um, we we have found that a lot of people will come and figure out that hey, this is not for them, but that's to be expected. Not just with open source, that's to be expected with like any sort of like in-person workshop, um, <coughs> and maybe the format doesn't agree with them, which is why sometimes we have, it's great to have these discussions where you're suggesting formats and and we can actually iterate on what we're doing. Maybe we're not doing something as well as we could. Um, and we're also, yeah, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we're very short of time and I wish this discussion could continue more. So I'm wondering, like, of the people here, um, I think the best way probably to move forward on this is if you're still interested in somehow continuing the conversation async, um, say participating in discussions or maybe we'll come up, we'll, we'll post our curriculum somewhere public and you can actually look through it, make suggestions, change it, um, if you want to do that, I will move this to a, a document where you can drop some way to share that with you. I don't know why my, where's my, that. So if you go to that, um, it'll take you to a page where you can either sign in or you can continue as guest. Um, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you can you can you can ping it you can write it down if you want to and I can take a piece of paper but that's totally your call. Oh, were you talking about Yeah, because I noticed you didn't have a laptop. Oh yeah, I'll yeah, post yeah. it in the collaboration summit. Thank you. Oh cool. You yeah. 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 Slack channel. Wait, do you have time for questions? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm I totally have time for a question. I don't mind missing coffee. I just don't want to impose that on other people. So yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm curious, you mentioned the importance that you do to discuss the importance of non code contributions. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if that's like specifically part of the curriculum because I know that's a way, I mean, a lot of folks who might not, I mean, coming from my background, I don't like to do a lot of stuff in person because of the environment and just yeah. like with my identity, I don't really want to chill with a whole bunch of people who are going to be there usually. Uh -huh. um, 
and but I think and but I think that if there's an emphasis on non-code contributions, you are reaching out to a more diverse set of people who work in tech, even yeah. tech writers, PMs, if the people who can contribute in other ways. So I'm yeah. just curious uh, how that's like. That is totally in the curriculum, cool. mainly because when we first started, we put together a very simple set of what do people think open source is and what about that do we frequently have to tell if people is wrong? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that came up very early on because when I got started, that's what I assumed because that's what everyone else told me. Um, and it only got like fixed with exposure, but not like deliberately someone telling me this is what it is. It was just like, oh, I realized there's this. And that's not so we emphasize that. Um, heavily in the beginning um, of, of each session. Yeah. Oh, that's totally amazing. Yeah. One one point I would like to add. Uh, as you mentioned, the mm -hmm. maintainer is like a burnout thing, but I think the contributor is also some kind of. If, if you're not a maintainer, if you're just a contributor, yeah, you, you get the burnout. Yeah. Uh, the other thing about uh, of being uh, uh, like starting with open sources, but I've seen that most people don't realize in the start is that they are just attracted to this term that yay, I'm an open source contributor or a maintainer or kind of, I have some commits, I can show it and like mention it somewhere. But as they start, they go on, after some time they, will, they lose that motivation and thing. That happen most of the time when they are not actually using that project or the thing they are trying to contribute to. Yeah. Like if you are a front end developer, you, you spend most of the time in the front end technologies yeah. and you start to try to contribute to a Ruby or a Python project, maybe you will make a typo fix and thing, but yeah. you will lose the motivation at the end. Yeah. So at the start, I think people don't realize which products, which products they should start with. Yeah. They just start with some projects, they do some commits, and then they lose it, and they, mm -hmm. don't, uh, they don't know where they belong in the open source community. It's, it's a yeah. huge community. Yeah. So for every specific person, there is a very like specific type of projects which they can maintain and contribute regularly as a A, and that's the point where which they should realize at the start of their contribution that they, that they start with. Yeah. If you are like open source, you can do it React, Angular, the, the technologies which are in the uh, like mm -hmm. front end. If you are on the back end, maybe Node.js, you can look on those technologies which are being used and yeah. you'll have the knowledge, you'll have the information and you will have to contribute to the project because you use it, you know how it works, you know the people who maintain it. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. So yeah, yeah we need to like look into the, to that thing also. As so to answer part of your question, um, we do offer ourselves as a resource. So the mentors in, in that workshop, we happen to contribute in the JavaScript space. Um, not all Node.js, two Node.js, one who runs a framework, like a, it's a REST um, mm -hmm. framework on top of Node, um, and another person who worked on P5.js. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do try to do is we try to make ourselves available to answer questions where it's like you can bring this if you're interested in a, in a project you can bring it to us and we'll help you identify a way to get into it yeah. so it's like oh um maybe this is a good way because they're very responsive if you uh if you try to contribute um like documentation changes but they're not so responsive if you try to contribute features yeah. it's easier for us i think to notice that kind of thing because we have a if if you're in open source for a little while, you might start noticing patterns that translate across projects. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing we do is we help people identify good repos to contribute to. So if it doesn't have, for example, at its core, like a code of conduct, and it's not enforced at all, you can see that in their discussion. We don't recommend people like um, go there. Uh, and we try to explain why, um, because sometimes that might not be immediately obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing I do want to make clear is that what we're trying to solve for is um, lowering the barrier of entry. Mm -hmm. We are not necessarily trying to create motivation to contribute to open source. What we're trying to do is, on the assumption that you have the motivation to contribute to open source, we're trying to lower the barrier so you don't know where to go after, mm -hmm. we're fixing that part. It's like, I want to contribute, and then we're trying to create that path from I want to contribute to I am contributing. But if we don't have a motivation to contribute, that's okay. Because you know, like people do stuff, they contribute for a while and they lose interest, they move on to a different technology, and that's that's fine. We have to accept that that's just the nature of people's time, right? But 
Yeah. I think well, like maybe yeah, you are totally right, but I think most of the time, like everyone in the dev community has at least contributed to some project, maybe a type or something. But the problem is that most of the developers they start, but they they, they just stop after some time because they don't they break the first barrier, but after that they don't know. Like yeah, I did first thing now. With, uh, so I see. So I see that. I see. Yeah, that's the that's the main problem. Starting point is relatively easy. Yeah. You can pick the typos in any open source repo. You can, uh, yeah, that's like the first step is very easy. The, mm -hmm. the next step to go to look for more things and yeah. to actually get involved, yeah. that's where you lose the the, the, the thing to. Oh, to, 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 I, I see. I might have I might have misinterpreted um, the recurring nature of the workshop, but mm -hmm. what I heard from it and got me excited um, is you know, I. I learned to code in a town that had. I learned a lot from my local tech community, mm -hmm. but you know, it's it's like a, it's a smallish town in Florida. It's like a college town, but you know, we still had a small tech scene. And um, you know, I like my but within that scene, we had meetups and all that, but there really weren't that that many people that contributed open source. Um, and you know, you were speaking about uh, motivation and how people, once they do get over that barrier, whatever barriers exist for them to get into mm -hmm. it, I, I totally see issues as like 100% non-code contributions as like an incredible way to contribute to open source, because depending on the project, it's you know, yeah. low barrier, it's awesome. But for me, having that social aspect of just, hey, come together, mm -hmm. we'll maybe give some talks, like this would be more of a meetup thing in my mind, mm -hmm. give some talks, some education, and then you know people can work on open source or, or discuss things or whatever. I was interpreting it as more of like people being able to come together and have that social aspect. Because I think that that's what keeps people motivated, in my opinion, is you know open source is community in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. If you're the kind of person where you can find that community easily online through your online persona, then it can really help you keep motivated. Mm -hmm. But if you're just a person who wants to try to gain that habit, you already like it, you know, whatever you're intrinsically motivated, or maybe you're trying to get a job, whatever. Um, I feel like having a recurring event where people come together and work on whatever projects they're going to work on. Maybe somebody pitches you a project, whatever. But um, that's really satisfying to me to think about bringing that social aspect, which I think makes open source so successful, mm -hmm. but bringing that into an online, a real life space, which I think can be more welcoming to other people, essentially. And, you know, whether someone's going to stick with the project or not, you know, you can't control that. But even just getting people to enjoy that process, because open source can be a, such a toxic place that you know, unless you can associate some good feels with it somewhere, somehow, yeah. and even if that's just having a beer or whatever you're doing with your friends mm -hmm. and you know, filling out issues or fixing bugs or whatever, yeah. that's like, that feels really powerful to me. It's the kind of place I would like yeah. to go. Yeah. And humans like this. Yeah, yeah, it's just like this. Yeah, yeah, I do want to push back just a half to about the idea that like everybody in the dev community is like made with done with their own open source. Because I've spotted things when I first I come from a very non traditional underrepresented background. Yeah. And I was like, this is a bug. I'm not gonna touch it because I don't want to put myself out there. Yeah. yeah. And like that is a thing that it that happens for a lot of folks when there's like you might feel that there's more of a risk, mm -hmm. you know, of like exposing yourself or you have maybe some imposter syndrome where you have all these other yeah. added things. So not everybody like gets over that first hurdle. Yeah. As yeah. Easily. Yeah. Or, yeah. or maybe they get over the first hurdle and then they have a terrible experience yeah, exactly. because that happens. Yeah, yeah. So and then they never come back. Yeah, yeah. 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 That was like having that that in life real life social you can be like, yeah, people suck on the internet. Mm -hmm. But you know, like we want you to be here, you know, at the very least. Like, that that feels powerful to me. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because like um we, I think it's the project's responsibilities to make sure that they are conducive to recurring like contributions and they're supportive and helpful. Um, and that's why we try to be very careful about recommending where people places go. We will not actually call out, like say, you should contribute here. Totally, yeah, just contribute somewhere until we know for sure that that place is good to contribute to. Either like one of us has contributed to it mm -hmm. or we know someone directly who has. Um, yes. Sorry, I didn't here. Uh, uh, you, I'm sure you're aware, but do you know there's a Node.js mentorship? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, cool. And I think it kicks off in a week or two. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a little different, though, because it's kind of more one on one peer mentorship. Yes. But we kind of need to, certainly not mm -hmm. 
we kind of need to combine some metrics for certain. That's interesting. Yeah. From the workshop, connect to the mentorship. That could yeah, be maybe. Yeah. 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 It's interesting that you bring up one on one because I was going to ask, like, what's the ratio of? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The the from the 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 Jillian and there's Fenty and there's yeah, yeah, one mentor. Like, <laughs> even, the, even when I was doing like three or four at uh, at Hack Illinois, um, okay, yeah, it, was, it was good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.